As we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Lord, we give thee thanks for this new day and for the opportunities that it presents to us. We pray that you'd bless your people gathered here, that you'd bless our study together, that, uh, that what we say and what we do would meet with your approval. We pray that you'd bless our loved ones and family that are far from us. Please continue to grant us safety and peace in our persons. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In verses 17 through 19, Brother Luke uh, writes, uh, he is a scholar. One of the things about him uh, it, that's refreshing and very perplexing when you're a student, when then, uh, the students begin to learn a little bit of the original language, they tend to, as students, will get a little bit cocky. And so Luke and Paul are guys that the teachers will put them into once they manifest that cockiness. You know, they get to thinking they're real great scholars, and they get, you put them in Luke, he can exploit the language because of his training, and uh, Paul's the same way, that they're like pulling their hair. And then that brings you right back down to earth, you know. And uh, it's kind of like in English trying to read Shakespeare or somebody like that. But anyway, verses 17 through 19 and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book, and he found the place, and I'm in the wrong spot. Um, a key. Uh, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea. This is chapter 6. And uh, Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him, and he healed, uh, be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured, and all the people were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. I'm going to go ahead and read from the, the sermon. And verse 20, he picks up with the sermon that it grows right out of that. Uh, and turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. But I say to you who, uh, you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others in the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. I would go on to say today with interest. But love your enemies and do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and your sons, you'll be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your father's merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Uh, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And he also spoke a parable to them, and he goes on and talks about uh, the blind man. Uh, if, if we assume here with the majority of uh, expositors, commentators, and what have you, that verses 17 through, really through 49, 
are a compressed version of what Matthew does in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In other words, Matthew's got more expansion on it. Luke gives uh, a condensed or, or just a more pointed rendition of the same sermon. If, that, if that's correct, then he, he went to, uh, when the multitude collected the previous evening, he went up to the mountain by himself, and he prayed there, uh, spent the night in prayer. And early in the morning, he called the disciples to him and selected the 12, and then descended for a distance to, as he's coming down the mountain, and he found, uh, as the slope comes out, there's a, a flat place for him. And he sat, he sat down, and the 12 gathered around him, and then other adherents that were, had begun to follow him, and then a much larger multitude of people, uh, considering what he has to say. He's, uh, at this point, having a, a very powerful impact in the community, and people are listening uh, to him, evaluating, trying to decide. After Jesus had performed a, a number of cures, then he commences this sermon, and uh, it's called the Sermon on the Mount because he was standing, we would call it a big hill. It's kind of like those mountains in Central America uh, or, the, or the Smoky Mountains. If you're ever in, in the Andes, You'd call that a hill, and so, but it was it was high ground, and uh, he's standing on that slope to deliver it. And in the first place, he addresses his disciples, and that includes the apostles, uh, recently appointed, and he utters these beatitudes to them. And we want to try to capture the context of some of these things that he says, not to diminish them. But not to, uh, people will overblow some of what he says because they ignore the context and, and it's almost unlivable. And I'll tell you what I mean in a moment. But he addresses them uh, with these beatitudes and by speaking specifically uh, to his followers, when he says, as the King James says, be ye poor, uh, he makes it evident that he does not congratulate everybody that's poor just for being poor. But he's, he is commending those that are his disciples that have made the decision that they're going to, they, if, if it's necessary, that they're going to relinquish the, the materialistic focus that a lot of people had then, like they do now, in order to pursue spiritual matters. And so he's, he's talking to persons that do not sink their wealth primarily in earthly things, and, um, uh, but who acknowledge their own poverty uh, and come to him as a result. They, they recognize their, that they're not uh, everything that they want to be and everything that they are called to be, and they have a humble spirit about them. And, and that's in the forefront of their life rather than how much stuff that I can get that's real shiny. Um, and, you know, you, if you get all the shiny stuff, I've seen it happen in people's lives, uh, and then your health breaks, now what? Because what's going to happen with all your stuff? It, yeah, you're going to leave it here, and then probably, uh, uh, you know, your relatives might get in a fight over it. Right? Because when green dollars start moving, you find out how people really are. And so that emphasis, and you know, and besides that, if, if you got just a modest uh, amount of things, there's nothing or anything inherently wrong with things, having a lot or a little. But say yours is more modest, does that make you less in God's eyes? But a lot of people go around feeling inadequate, and a lot of people in our society, in this consumer society, get into debt that they can't handle. And why is that? Because they're made to believe, well, if you don't have this, this, and this, I mean, you just, you know, you just, you're just out of it. You're inconsequential. Jesus didn't look at it like that. We shouldn't look at it like that. Everybody's consequential, aren't they? Who'd he die for? Yeah, he died for everybody. And he wants them all in the kingdom. Now, you know that's that's why these brethren have continued to go out to the uh, out to the Polanski unit for all these years. Uh, you got some bad boys out there. 
But wouldn't it be great to turn that guy and, and get him in a better place in his mind and in his thinking? Wouldn't that be good? It has been good with some of those guys. Uh, because we don't know from when, you know, in any given time, what kind of burdens that other fellow that he's carrying and what kind of pressures he's been under. That doesn't uh, ever excuse criminal conduct, but if you learn the story of some of those people, um, you know, I, we had a, one of our deacons at Adamsville from there many years ago was the chief deputy in the county. And Jim would say, you know, but, they're, uh, but by the grace of God, there go I. You know, he'd arrested a lot of those uh, boys. And uh, I remember one time I was down at the jail and, and some of them were down there and grousing about being in jail. And Jim, Jim was out there and he said, well, I've been in jail more than all of you. I've been a law man for all these years and I'm in jail every day, fooling with you not his, you know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and they hadn't thought about it like that because they, some of those guys, uh, unfortunately, were frequent flyers, and they had a hard time with self, you know. And uh, But that's just one manifestation of that. And so Jesus addresses uh, something that's very, uh, very much a part of our own society. And these people that he's commending are the ones that do not seek their wealth and their life in er earthly things, but they are able to acknowledge their own poverty, particularly from a spiritual standpoint, which is what he's interested in, and come to him uh, to seek real life. Um, what he's offering begins here and goes right on into eternity without interruption. What the worldly class of people offer are some trinkets here if you can make it into the elite classes. But have you noticed how sorry uh, from a, any kind of moral, any kind of measure that you can put on it, the, a lot of the elite classes are. I mean, they're really not admirable people, are they? You know, uh, I mean, there's just a lot of vulgarity among them and coarseness among them and the language they speak, the way that they present themselves, the way they treat their, um, their spouses and, and, you know, treat each other, the way they don't take care of their children. And on and on and on you can go and don't derive any pleasure from saying that and don't want to get like the Pharisee, well, ha, 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 we're better than you. But the point is, I mean, those, those lives are dissolute and they're, yet they're held up. I see all the time, because I don't even know who any of them are. They're not, they're not stars to me because I don't follow that. But this one or that one, you know, dead at 32. At 32? You know, did they have cancer? What? No, it was an OD, or it was, you know, some something that didn't have to happen at all. And they're young people at the top of their game, worth millions of dollars. And yet they're so unhappy or so dissatisfied with their life uh, that they either take it on purpose or uh, accidentally harm themselves to the point that it's, uh, that it's fatal. You know, and, and so... I mean, at some point, I'm thinking, guys, it ought to dawn on some of you to turn around and ask, isn't there a better way? And there is a better way. Uh, Jesus here makes reference to persons who, who do not seek it in the here and now, where out, outward uh, poverty leads anyone to realize his utter dependence on God and to walk humbly with his Lord. Such a person, Jesus says, that's who's going to be blessed in the doing of that uh, in measure even in this life but more abundantly in the next life can he expect to be rich and glorious and to be fulfilled spiritually uh, the poor of this type are generally members of his kingdom Jesus doesn't say uh, yours will be did he? he said you are members of my kingdom, people of this spirit. And, uh, but only at the final consummation do his people enjoy the full measure of what's coming. There are blessings here. It's a blessing to me to gather together with people of like mind and to reinforce and encourage one another. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't get a lot of encouragement. I don't get nice notes from the Bandito Motorcycle Gang, do y'all? 
Anybody in MS-13 send you, you know, a happy birthday card, something like that? I mean, that's an extreme example, but you, you get what I'm saying. Out there from that rough and tumble crowd, I don't get very much encouragement from them, and I don't think any of us do. And so that's why it is a useful thing for us to gather together with all the warts and, and, and you know, uh, difficulties and problems and struggles that we bring to the assembly, uh, it can still be said that we're trying, we're trying awful hard to get better, to do better, to be better, that we at least have that as a goal. In verse 21, he says, those who are spiritually hungry, those who realize their own need, their own lack, uh, yearn for a fullness which he brings, he said, they'll receive the blessing of the Lord. Um, I, I've mentioned it a number of times recently, I know, but it's, it's coming up, so I'm already beginning to uh, read and study the course on the Godhead that I teach for Bear Rowling. Uh, that's a, you know, to contemplate the triune God is an overwhelming thing to try to get your head around, just the stuff that's revealed. And there's more there, infinitely more there. Than, than what we can perceive because we are limited by time, space, and, and some things that won't obtain when we go to the other side. But uh, he, at least, usually among his, well, among his, not usually, among his people, there is a recognition, even from the best and the most mature, that we're not worthy of what the Lord did and what he continues to do that man rebelled and man gave up any claim that he had and, and we cannot reason to him unaided that we're dependent on him revealing himself to us. I've said it a lot of times, but it is true. And if you don't believe me, just get the, uh, uh, the works of Socrates or Plato or one of those old Greeks. You know, they, they posed the right questions. They were smart enough to ask the right questions, but without revelation from God, I mean, these are towering minds. And without revelation from God, they got all the wrong answers. Man wasn't able to do it. I would argue to anybody anywhere that if anybody was going to get there just on sheer human brain power, they would have done it. Brilliant, brilliant minds didn't get there. And you got some pretty bright people around today, but they, don't, they can't get there uh, absent a revelation from God. And so uh, those that are spiritually hungry, he says, you'll be fed. And those that mourn deeply in sorrow over their sins and the dishonoring of the Lord by the world, he said, they, you'll be comforted. And it really is heartbreaking when you think about uh, there's too much sadness in the world. There's too much suffering in the world. God made a beautiful world. And when you can get out in what he made that hasn't been tampered with, it, it, uh, it's extraordinarily beautiful, exquisite. My dad used to talk about the Fiji Islands when they, they went there in World War II and took that back from the Japanese. But uh, he said, even torn up by war, you know, these orchids were just out there in those jungles and, and other flowers that he said, just, it's just absolutely gorgeous. He always said, I'd love to go back there. You know, now that many years have passed and war's long over, I'd just love to go back. He loved, loved the, he said, the beaches, the ocean, everything was just gorgeous. Uh, and it is. We have a school there, uh, an extension school. Uh, oh, the brother's name, forgets me, uh, leaves me that, uh, that runs that. But he's been there for a number of years and uh, has, uh, you know, we've got some congregations of the Lord's people there and, and it's just much better today. But that, those people that, that recognize their own unworthiness, that mourn, you know, it's hard to throw rocks at everybody else if we'll be honest with ourselves about ourselves, isn't it? Okay, good. Somebody was here. Uh, if, if you know, just really get honest, because you have to fight yourself or have to fight the devil all the time and tell him, you know, in the text, doesn't this text say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you? Didn't that happen in James? Uh, chapter 4 and verse 17, I believe. I believe I'm right. 
uh, 7 or 17. Brother Kibble used to say, it's in there, and just read on. And <laughs> he got some age on him and, and couldn't always remember. He said, just read on, brother, and it's in there. Do you good. Read. Read it all. Um, and so uh, resist and he'll flee. That's all he can do. But uh, it, he is a, a beguiling character. Um, in verse 22 and 23, when unbelieving men hate and despise his adherents, brethren, disciples, when they, when they dis besmirch their good name and persecute them, uh, he said, regard that as a privilege. In other words, you are godly enough or Christian enough to be recognized as such. See, when bad people come after you and they can successfully target you, I mean, you got a few brethren uh, that I believe would are so far undercover. Maybe that's what they're doing, trying to be undercover agents, you know, and just playing the part of being in league with the devil because you can't tell the difference between them and the banditos, you know. Um, and I don't know anybody like that, but I'm just saying that you, you, Jesus said, if you were identified and you're persecuted for carrying my name, count that an honor because I'm going to honor it. It'll be honored in eternity uh, because when he comes back, of course, things are going to be changed and they're going to be changed in a hurry. And so uh, he, uh, verses 22 and 3, he said, uh, it, it'll be to them, if you receive that mistreatment, it'll be proof to you that you're living in true fellowship with the Lord and all the genuine prophets of God. Because how did they treat the genuine prophets? Everybody said, uh, well, you know, said, man, Jeremiah, you're such a good guy. We're going to buy you a new chariot, right? Got a new house here, and here's keys. They didn't have keys, but anyway, you know, this is your house and all that. That didn't happen, did it? No, didn't they throw him in an old empty cistern, that old mud and muck and all that, you know, threatened to kill him all the time? Uh, Ezekiel was not terribly popular. Isaiah wasn't uh, terribly popular at times. Um, you know, on and on and on, and the Lord just points out, I mean, man's had a history of mistreating those that bring, you know, if you're a sinner and you're having fun being a sinner and somebody comes and says, you really shouldn't be doing that. That, that needs to be modified as soon as possible. How's that play out? Not well. Um, I mean, if you've raised children and they get their heart set on something, you have to tell them no. How's that? How's that work? You know, if uh, if they're toddlers, I saw a, a cute thing on the internet the other day. It was a father and a little girl, and she was throwing a fit, and he had her out on the parking lot. He didn't lay a hand on her, but he just ignoring this this little child, and of course she's cutting up little bit and finally she sort of gets down has to take a breath he said you through and he and he's told us he said everybody's seeing you now act like a fool <laughs> and he went he went on and, and talked to her a little bit he said but I, we're gonna go back in the store if you're through but if you do it again we're gonna come out and we're just we're gonna be out here in this old boring parking lot now you decide what you want to do but what, what, well, I don't know what it was she'd sat upon, but she had something in her mind that she got to have it and have it right now. Well, are, are adults much different than that? Uh, I've seen times where elders would make a decision. On, I mean, it's a matter of judgment, but they, I mean, who's charged with that responsibility? Who's charged with the responsibility of shepherding the flock? They are. And okay, so they make a decision about something, and it's not, you could go either way. It's not a big theological point, but it's, man, they made this, I, I don't agree with the decision, so I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to throw a running fit. I'm going to quit the church. I'm going to threaten, uh, breathe out threatenings and slaughter. And uh, You know, now I know none of y'all have ever done that, but, but you've probably seen it. And so Jesus is calling us to a whole different way of being and living. Verse 24 through 26, he next addresses the persons who do not follow him, but who in self-righteousness and pride revel only in their earthly positions, 
and, and possessions. You know, they're not going to follow him. Who's he? You know, he's from Galilee. Can any good thing come out of Galilee from, you know, he's from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of there? I mean, who's that guy? Who'd he study under in Jerusalem? What rabbi is certifying this man? And on and on and on. What, what do you, I mean, what's his qualification? Well, he's a real good carpenter. Carpenter? See, now carpenters in that day and time didn't make the kind of money carpenters make today. And it wasn't an honored trade so much then like it is now. Because the hoity-toity Jews, you know, if you, had, if you got your hands dirty, well, then that was bad. That, that was unseemly to them. And so here they are and uh, uh, feeling all smug and self-righteous. And, and uh, you know, what was the song that Ray Stevens did about the squirrel going to church and Sister Bertha Better Than You was there, you know? And of course... I know none of y'all can identify with Sister Bertha better than you, but, but uh, you know, lesser people can. You, there's, there's people like that. And they were, like, they were around when Jesus was here. And guess what? They were the, one of the biggest problems that he faced. More than pagans was the people that should have received their Messiah. I mean, what, what should have the Jews' posture been? Because they've got the prophetic writings. They've got the law of Moses so they've got all. They've got the other writings. They've got all of that. What should their posture have been? They should have been waiting for him, and, and as soon as he showed up, they should have acknowledged him, right? It's not like everything's been done in a corner. It's been it's been done in in the open, but they've read the the read into the prophecies what they wanted. And what they wanted was an earthly ruler that would come in and and uh, establish a powerful kingdom. And would rid them of these of these uh, obnoxious uh, oafs, the Romans, and get them out of our country, and we'll be powerful once again, like we were when David was king. That's what they want. That's not what God said. He never said that, and uh, so they they read that into the text, and that's what they call in school eisegesis, exegesis. You've heard that word. That just that means to get out what's there, to dig out what's there. And I said, Jesus is to put in what is in there. It's to fill it up with stuff. And so, uh, the the these persons that he's talking about, he, you know, they're they're not. And in, I don't want to say this too. He he is not by any means addressing everybody that's outwardly rich, because not everybody that's successful, highly successful in this world, has the attitude that he's addressing, do they? I mean, well, I know some, uh, we, we've got some generous brethren. And a lot of the work that we do, uh, brethren, I mean, they give an overabundance. Um, the, the work down in Guatemala, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funded properly, largely because of the effectiveness of, of Hiawatha and Byron. And, and uh, they're so very careful about the way they use it. But, I mean, they can, do, they can conduct the work. And uh, all around the world, there's now 30-some extensions. Now, not all of them are as well-run as Byron and High. Um, you know, guys have different skill levels. But, um, but they're trying to bring everybody up. You know, we, we involve locals. Well, a lot of them have never had any experience uh, because they live every day. And so you put them in a situation where now we have... Uh, Costs that are involved with staff and all that, that that's a learning process. Um, but we have well-to-do people that will, that will fund some of those things. And some of those people even come down and tutor brethren on how to do it properly. And that's a great, great blessing. And so, uh, but, so he's not talking about that, but he's talking about people that do not acknowledge their dependence on God. See, I don't know the man at Microsoft, what's his name, Gates, Mr. Gates. I don't know Mr. Gates, but I, I don't know if he acknowledges God. Uh, I don't know Mr. Bezos that, that owns, um, uh, what is he owns, Amazon. Yeah, I, I don't know him. I don't know if he acknowledges God or not, but he got 
what he got with God's blessing. You know, it's not because he's so much smarter and better than everybody else. And I'd say that on anybody. A uh, wise man, prudent man, acknowledges God's grace and God's providence and God putting things in his hands. And what everybody ought to recognize is when God puts something like that, he gifts you in that way, he's, he's going to ask you about that in judgment. You know, I always, uh, we taught our kids they were able to do well in school and, and we're thankful they worked hard. But I always told them, God's been good to you, but he's going to ask you for, about that. And you have an obligation to him and to your community to do good with what he's put in your hands and in your head. And that's true for every one of us. And, and he gifts people in different ways and amazing uh, gifts that people have, some of them, uh, or a lot of them, really. Most everybody's got something that they excel at if they'll just go ahead and, and let themselves do it. But the self-exalted that are smart and powerful and rich in all these things in their own eyes do not sometimes see the need to flee to him and do not recognize their inadequacy. You remember in the book of Revelation, it opens with letters to the churches. And you remember him saying to some arrogant brethren, you know, you say this, but you're poor and blind and naked. They didn't even know it. They thought they had it going on. And so, uh, because they labor, these people labor under this delusion that, that we got it going on, then they don't feel that they have a need for him, and they starve to death, spiritually speaking. And that's sad, sad, sad to see people that are just immensely talented and not use that in a way to enrich their lives and the lives of those about them. And I'm talking about spiritually enrich their lives. You know, uh, God's placed these things at your disposal, what good you could do with it and how much you could affect people in a, in a very positive way. And then not to do that, uh, that's, that's a sad thing to see. Uh, he said, because in this life, they take their pleasure only in earthly things of their earth. And they are very significantly uh, because in the afterlife they will experience the spiritual uh, emptiness, I'm trying to say, that they, that they did here and the lack of happiness. Again, you have these people that are at the pinnacle from what a worldly materialistic society can offer, and there's a high, high percentage of them that are ineffective in just living life. I mean, do you notice that? Do you ever just follow events and what have you and take, take note of how many of them fall early in life um, and, and abuse themselves? Or I think about Willie and Waylon and the boys, you know. Oh, Willie... Uh, he's, he got old somehow. I guess he just pickled himself, you know, with that, that Jack Daniels whiskey. But, I mean, I've uh, known him as an entertainer since he was in his 40s. He looked just like he does now. I mean, rode hard and put up wet. And I, don't, I don't mean any insult by that, but I'm just saying it's been rough on him. And I saw him interviewed here not too long ago. He'd smoked so much marijuana, he's blown his lungs out pretty, pretty significantly. Well... You know, that, that pays dividends, doesn't it? And, uh, and so that, that it, it's just a sad thing to watch that and to see people go down that road. And, and now they're getting belligerent towards people that try to walk with God. Um, and, but Jesus says, if they treat you like that, cloud up and rain all over them, didn't he? Just whoop the fire out of them. Y'all teach them, right? And... Uh, some of us grew up with, with you know, kind of with that, that um, being the dominant theme uh, where we grew up, but it, it's not effective. Because if I'm going to do that to you and you're of the same kind of a mindset that I am, then what are you going to do? You're going to do it right back. And then I've got to do something worse. And then you're going to do something worse, right? That's what you call war. 
That's what that is. And you know, when, and when you get through with it, you got a bunch of young men on both sides dead, and, and many others maimed. And people they try to make movies and glorify that, but that's that's what I heard uh, Jocko Wilkes or Winks or what he was a former SEAL. Him and Leif Babin have written a couple of books together on leadership. And he just got up and committed truth. And he said, you know, carnal war is about killing people. And that repels folks. And, and he would, I'm sure, would say, good. Because it's a bad way to settle an argument. It's Jesus trying to keep his people from going down that road. It's, you know, it, it gets pushed on you sometimes. So you, we want to understand the context here. He's talking to his people about how they're to conduct themselves in their day-to-day -day activities. He's not condemning all military. He's not condemning all police at, at all because he sanctions it too many other places. But he's talking to his people. Because if we don't follow his instructions here, we're going to get to that other place. And we're going to have to have some measures taken that are not pleasant, that are not good. And it leave a lot of hostility and, and inflict suffering and what have you. And so... He didn't want, he didn't want to see us do that. Uh, Jesus, in verse 27, uh, really the verses 20 through 26 refer to the qualifications of those who, who are admitted as members of his kingdom and the fate of those who on account of their life and attitude will have no share in his salvation. Now, you get him to verse 27 through 45, and he starts to announce principles according to which the members of his kingdom must live in relation to their fellow men. And it's notice it's worthy here that Jesus uh, addresses all the hearers, you which hear. He's gone, initially he's talking to his disciples, letting other people be there. That's fine, they're listening. But now he, he specifically goes out, you know, not only to his disciples, but he's making demands of the others. And he makes it clear that though these principles are in the first instance applicable to members of the kingdom, that they hold for everybody. I'm responsible whether I'm a Christian or not, aren't I? According to what, if you accept what the scriptures teach, I am responsible to him because he's my creator and sustainer, whether I acknowledge it or not. But, uh, and so he's, he's making them know that. Everyone's under obligation to practice what he lays down here as absolute demands. And he who does not do so is guilty before God. Um, people don't think about judgment much anymore because guys that have the same job that I do don't talk very much about it. You know, I reminded a young couple yesterday that, that what you say here is witness in heaven. And, and so it's important that we understand that. that. Is this a tradition? Yes, it's traditional. But it is also the case that, that when we, uh, a young couple and their families come together and they, they say those words, that that's witnessed in heaven. And we're responsible to him for that. Jesus uh, wants everybody to understand that the Jews tried to limit the divine commandment, for example, to care for your neighbors, they wanted to limit that to Jews, and not only just to Jews, but they wanted to limit it to Jews they themselves decided were worthy fellow countrymen. Now, you're getting, you know, you're getting in dangerous territory when you start trying to crawl up on God's throne. There's a right and there's a wrong, but, you know, when you start pronouncing. Uh, I have a friend here locally. I, I've used him as an illustration. I don't call his name, uh, but he's a member of a denomination. And he told me one time, he said, well, you just think I'm lost, don't you? And I said, we've been friends a long time, Bubba, but we're not going to stay friends if you start trying to make me do God's job. You know, you and I will both be judged on the basis of what the Bible says, but don't, don't put me in that position because that's not me. I'm not going to pronounce for him. Uh, there are a lot of people, uh, people that will, uh, but that's a, that's, a, that's a dangerous place to go. Uh, you know, 
What happens if somebody gets out here on the side of the road, for example, and they accost one of their neighbors and, and knock knots on him and say, I've placed him under citizen's arrest. How's that going to go? You're going to be in more trouble than he is. I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. <laughs> that, that deputy or officer, and he says, you did what? You're not authorized to be, you know, you can't do that. So if they're not assaulting you, you can't just be go laying hands on folks in the neighborhood, right? I, surely we still understand that. And um, so Jesus rejects this false limitation completely. And he commands that we even love our enemies. Now, that's a hard one, but you want to look at the context. But I, I, let me give you an illustration. My father was, uh, Mona's daddy was too, was a battlefield medic in World War II. And I've never talked to her dad, but my dad, uh, and I'm sure he did, I know he did the same thing. They took care of enemy soldiers too. Because the way we fought, at least in that war, is when a man is shot down, he's a wounded man. He's no longer to be viewed as, as an adversary so to speak. And what, do, what did they do? Well, they bound those wounds. Then um, in another war my father went to, the Korean War, they had a compound for prisoners that were wounded uh, too seriously to move at that point where they took care of them and nursed them back to health to where they could go to uh, internment camp or wherever they kept them. And, I mean, our guys did that. And I have some letters in my lockbox written uh, by Korean prisoners to my father because he was the, the top sergeant and officers didn't want to mess with it, so they, they made the sergeant do it, you know. But they took care of those guys and nursed them back to health. And they wrote some of them some of the most beautiful letters because they'd been told that the Americans are cannibals and they're this and they're that and uh, just bizarre stuff. And then they got there and they got clean clothes. They got their wounds taken care of. They ate three squares a day. They had a cot to get in, and, you know, it was heated in the wintertime and all that. And so it was totally different than what they'd been told. And, and a lot of them, I've told you that before, a lot of them stayed in, in the south. They didn't go back to the north. They, they, they just they renounced that and uh, finished their lives out, most of them probably by now, uh, in, the, in the south. Well, that's loving your enemy. It's not necessarily that you have to, you know, I don't feel towards my adversaries like I feel toward my wife or towards my children or my grandchildren. He didn't say you have to have the exact same feeling, but when he talks about love and agape love, you know, it's active goodwill. It's seeking what is best for the other man, whether he uh, is going to vote for you or not. This is totally off subject, but have you ever noticed how politicians show up grinning uh, just for election? And it's like you're the best friend. You all ever notice that? Anyway, um, he's, he's talking about agape, and agape is, is active goodwill. And I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to do the right thing, you know. Uh, I don't know how you're going to be, but I'm going to treat you honorably, and I'm going to treat you respectfully as long as you let me. Remember, he said, as much as is possible, live at peace with all men. Some people can't live at peace with. He not understood that. But this is, this is having to do with our uh, general day-to-day -day activities. In verses 28 through 30, in these three verses, he gives practical examples of how you practice love towards your enemy. Uh, they, they must wish and pray for blessings, Christians must, on those who curse and insult them. You know, pray that they will come to a point that they see with clarity and not hostility. You can pray that, right? I can pray that those uh, various and sundry radical groups that have been trying to burn down Portland every night for the past year, that they will, they will see with clarity. Um, I think we ought to take and, and, and take them on a tour of any number of countries I could take them to, and if you don't like it here, well, let, let's just go over here, spend a few days, and, and if you'd like, we'll, we'll leave you there. Uh, but I think what, and I don't think I know what was gonna happen, I think, well, you know, the good old U.S. of A, not so bad. Not so bad at all. 
Uh, is it? You've already made this statement. These are hard things for us. Oh, yes. We have to seek the Lord's help because this goes against, we can say, human nature. Yeah. Now, it doesn't come easy, does it? And, but if we allow ourselves to get in tit for tat, so that's what we've been doing for thousands of years, you know. Uh, you do something to me, I'm going to do something worse to you. You, know, you. you kill one of my cows and I'm going to burn your cornfield down. How about that, you know? And then here you go. Somebody, somewhere, has got to say, all right, that's enough. And, and the land of my ancestors in Scotland, that, the reason... They were under the domination of the English is because they wouldn't quit fighting each other. They're divided up into tribes. That's what the clans are, is tribes. And the Campbells and the MacDonalds and the different ones, you know, the big powerful tribes fought each other. Uh, and they wouldn't quit doing that. And the English came in there and established law and order, you know. But so that it doesn't come easy. Uh, and he didn't say it was easy, he was a revolutionary. But not revolutionary in the sense of we're going to go backwards and reestablish some of this barbaric behavior that we've that we've seen in the 20th century and late 19th century. But no, we're gonna we're gonna it's going to be a new order. You know, pray for those that persecute you, bless those that, that misuse you, try to help them, and you know, and if you treat them right when they believe all these terrible things about you, you know what? Sometimes uh, it'll get through. Well, I've heard all these terrible things, but that's not been my experience. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. We'll continue there next week and uh, move on past that wonderful sermon Jesus preached.